But now, otherwise, I won't be finished by two. Well, uh, first of all, I'm Elias Latsch from Italy. I'm an archaeologist by trade, and I wrestle for uh, Innsbruck. And um, yeah, it's my first time here, and thank you for having me. <coughs> so let's get started. The topic today is cross training for HEMA wrestling. I'm saying HEMA wrestling because I'm coming from wrestling and I don't pretend to be an expert on weapons fighting. But I think if you can take some points from this and apply it to your own stuff, it should work. So what I'm going to be talking about here is uh, first of all, I'm going to break down wrestling for you, what it takes to win a, to win a wrestling match. Second, we're going to compare some of the modern styles in, in terms of their characteristics and how much of a carryover they can have to Hema wrestling. Next, we're going to analyze techniques. I've picked some of the Fechtbücher from you, uh, for you, and uh, have put some comparisons of modern wrestling up there. Then we're going to talk about strength and conditioning for Hema, the various principles and uh, training tools. We're going to look at strength and conditioning in wrestling around the world and finish with some standards and sample training programs that you can try out and take home. Okay, factors in wrestling. I'm saying factors because it's like in a multiplication. If one of these factors is zero, then the whole result will be nothing to talk about. So, we have technique. I think we can agree on that here. We have explosiveness, speed. We have endurance, both aerobic and anaerobic. We have strength, both dynamic and static or isometric. We have agility, basically the ability to move in space, the whole coordination thing and gymnastic ability. We have toughness, how much pain you can handle. And we have roughness, how much pain you can dish out. Uh, let's face it, wrestling is a combat sport. Without being aggressive and without being rough within the rules and sometimes beyond the rules, you won't make it very far. Then we have feel, which is basically the ability to judge your opponent and to anticipate what he's going to do. Um, then physical size, of course. We have weight classes to protect the small guys from the bigger guys and not the other way around. Then we have wrestling experience and wrestling tactics. And finally we have wrestling style. Because sometimes when two wrestlers of uh, the same caliber meet, one of them is going to come out on top because he can deal with the other guy's style better than the other guy can with his. For example, if a really technical wrestler who's about average tough meets a wrestler who's slightly above average in technique but very rough, then Mr. Tenderfoot is going to take a beating and he won't like to fight very much. Okay, let's look at cross training in HEMA wrestling in terms of wrestling training. So, no conditioning, no strength for the moment, just wrestling. So if, if you, for example, you train wrestling in a HEMA club, usually out of 10 people, maybe 3 to 5 will wrestle, and 1 or 2 of them will be any good. So if you can only train with 1 or 2 guys, you're not going to become better at a very fast rate. However, if you go to a judo club, and maybe they have 12 or 15 black belts there, every one of them will be able to give you a good fight and you meet different opponents, you meet different builds, and it's all good for your experience. So, also the instructors in the different wrestling styles are usually very good. Um, most of 
of the bigger cities will at least have a former national competitor in some of in, in one of the styles. Then spending time on the mat with an opponent who's actually trying to fight you is going to toughen you <coughs> up as compared to just training in the weight room. Training in the weight room makes you bigger and stronger, but it doesn't make you tougher. Um, you can learn new techniques and you can learn new angles on techniques you already know. And sometimes, through the variations, you gain a better understanding of the original technique. And you do more repetitions of the throws, of the setups, of the ties, and all of this <coughs> comes together to build up your muscle memory, which is very important. So, to sum it up, it can improve you in all factors of wrestling. We good so far? If there any questions, just fire away. Okay. So, we're going to compare some modern styles now. First of all, we're going to look at Olympic wrestling, which is a Roman and freestyle. The major advantage of this style is it doesn't rely on your clothing to grip. So you can basically fight a naked opponent as well as a clothed one. It is also very dynamic. It requires a high degree of gymnastic ability and it's great for conditioning and endurance. If you've ever wrestled in a high level club, then you'd probably agree it's one of the hardest things you can do on a physical level. It has a high toughening component. To, just to tell you an example, a number of wrestlers have bruises and even calluses on their ribs from pressure. So, if you rest long enough, you'll be at a point where, for a normal guy, if his nose gets broken, the fight is over, and for you, it's Tuesday. <laughs> so, we come to the neutral points. I've marked this with uh, zero. There are weight classes. Weight classes are generally very good because the light guys are usually good at techniques, but in terms of an understanding of HEMA wrestling, <coughs> they are so-so because you often forget to look at how you have to fight someone who's bigger or much stronger than you. Wrestling relies on soft mats. That leads to some technical adaptation, as we're going to see in a moment. Um, and wrestlers usually don't structure their techniques too much. So they have like groups of techniques, for example, double legs and so on and so forth, and everything beyond that is just a variation, which can be good in some cases, but if you start from, from zero, basically, it's sometimes a bit confusing. Um, also, it's very rare that someone starts wrestling as an adult. There are basically no classes for adult beginners and I think there's about 3 to 5% women total in wrestling. So there's a good chance if you go to a wrestling club you're not going to see any other women there. And yeah, the rules are a bit debatable. I don't like them very much, especially with the new changes. But that's another topic. And as you can see from the pictures, the clothing is a bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if you can read this from back there, but anyway. Uh, another drawback is that wrestlers tend to be a bit macho. As can be seen by the t-shirts here. For example, the one on the right, date a wrestler, he'll have you on your back in no time. <laughs> and yeah, these are some of the tamer ones that come up. Then we're going to look at judo. Judo is good because there's a great number of clubs. They are usually inexpensive. You can expect, expect to pay something around 100 euros per year, which is very, very cheap compared to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example. Judo places a high premium on grip strength and grip endurance, which <coughs> I think is great. And they also emphasize clean technique. You're going to be taught according to the Gokion, which is a concept that builds from the simple techniques to the more complex ones. Um, Judith also teaches falling on hard ground, 
which I think for everyone is a good point because accidents happen. And if you're going to fight in HEMA, in Spiral, you're going to drop at some point. It's like that. Yeah, there are a lot of adult beginners, both male and female. The, the teaching is by structures, and the names of the techniques are used internationally. So you can talk with someone from Japan, and he's going to know exactly what you're talking about, which is not the case in wrestling. Um, yeah, again, there are very slippery mats, which leads to some uh, adaptation in technique. And there are weight classes, then there's the clothing, the rules, which are very strange again. And uh, yeah, overall, judo guys tend to place less of a focus on conditioning. Judo is a bit more tactical, but not too much. Um, there tends to be less improvising, at least in the lower levels, which is due to the structured, te uh, structured teaching. And again, the clothing is rather strange. A uh, quick look at Sambo, which is a Russian version of, of Judo mixed with some folk styles and wrestling. Um, it basically combines, combines <coughs> some of the good points of Judo and wrestling. However, um, there are very few schools around of Sambo. And yeah, the clothing is strange again. I, begin, I think I'm seeing a pattern there. <laughs> um, a good point about Sambo, if you can find a school, is they teach you how to wrestle both on soft mats and hard mats. Uh, some of the schools incorporate striking as well, which is called combat Sambo. And some of them also teach self-defense, which is called military Sambo or Sistema. Then we have the various folk styles. They usually combine gripping with clothing and without clothing. For example, sumo, which have the belts to grip, or the Austrian Rampen, or the Swiss Schwingen. Um, they have rules that have been virtually unchanged for a couple hundreds, hundreds of years. And they often train on natural surfaces, which I think is a good point, especially if you come from a Hema background. Um, there are no weight classes in these traditional styles, which I would say is a plus, but it can make learning a bit more difficult <coughs> and painful. And there are very few schools that teach these styles outside of their country of origin. And again, the clothing is rather, or in some cases, really weird. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to look at some techniques, the traditional ones on the left and the modern ones on the right. I hope you can see a thought it <coughs> Anyway, we have a double leg attack from Codex Wallenstein on the left and below we have von Auerswald. And uh, Wallerstein is basically a football tackle with a headbutt into the guy's stomach. Uh, while it's not illegal in modern wrestling, it's kind of an outlaw technique, not of the nice thing to do. I love it, but not all of my training partners do. Uh, while for our while it's basically a snatch of both of the guy's legs backward, which tends, uh, happens to be the same as the traditional Morotegari in Judo. Um, as it used to be. This technique has been banned as of, two, uh, of uh, two years ago, I think. They forbid all grips to the legs now, which I think is <laughs> not a good idea. Then we have the wrestling techniques on the right, and you should be able to see clearly that they are a product of weight classes and soft mats. Weight classes because you go in there, you lift the guy, you dump him backwards, or you go down on your knees and dump him to the front, and you wouldn't go down if there were no mats there. Then let's have a look at the shoulder throw or see you which is the most, uh, yeah, one of the most popular but probably <coughs> the most famous throw in Judo. A shoulder throw. It's not very common in Hema wrestling. I think Wallerstein is the only one that seems to have sort of a traditional see you in this book, uh, the one below. While 
The one on top is more common, it's more of an arm break over the shoulder. In, in Judah, however, it's a, a very clean and very high throw, after which you remain standing. However, in wrestling, you drop, you, you drop down on your knees, again, there's the mats, and you throw him over. Also, in, in wrestling, you turn a bit farther than in Judah, which uh, you wouldn't want to do in Judah because if you throw him like that and his arm is over there, when he comes down, he can choke you, which he's not allowed to do in wrestling. Then, there's the fireman's carry, or kataguruma in Judah. At, uh, on the left side, we have the Codex Wallerstein on top, and on our side below. Uh, they both do the Kataburuma standing, as they do in Judah. While in wrestling, again, <coughs> the guy drops on his knees. There's the mats there, and also freestyle wrestlers tend to stand something like this. And you're not going to drop your level down there and pick me up and throw me. It's just too much work. <coughs> However, the kneeling version has become become common in Judah too, just because it's quicker. And again, it doesn't take much effort. You don't have to be able to do squats with the guy on your shoulders. You can dump him just the same. Um, there's the backward sweep or trip, which is called Kosoto Gari or Kosoto Gake in Judah. Um, Codex Wallerstein at the left at the top, he just places his heel behind the guy's leg and give him, gives him a slap and lets him fall over. Um, for our side, it's a bit more sportive and more technical. He steps behind there, gets an underhook and dumps him over there. Um, in, in judo, because of the gari is usually a very dynamic technique, he goes in and sweeps him, which is possible because the floor is very slippery in judo. While in wrestling, usually the guy's foot gets stuck on the mat. And also on concrete, it's a bit of a toss-up. In wrestling, there's a number of throws that can fall in this category. There's a double leg where you hook two guys, so you go down, you place this leg behind his heel and drive him over. Or you can lift him up, sweep him with the, with the knee. Or in some cases, you step outside and you still play him over. Okay, I think this is the last one. The uh, Tahoe, of course, is the Bubenwurf. It's usually referred to as uh, Tomoe Nagi. You place the foot in the guy's stomach, let yourself fall back, and throw him over. The Wallerstein and the Judo version are very similar. The only difference <coughs> being that in Judo you can grab the sleeves, which makes for a very secure grip, and Wallerstein grabs the tricep. In wrestling, this kind of throw is rarely ever done because you go flat on your back and at least you give up points or you lose the match. So instead they have something called the grapevine suplay, which is you hook the leg from the inside, you hop in and again you throw him over. It's one of the most spectacular and difficult throws in wrestling. Okay. So now we've looked at the wrestling side, let's look at the pure physical side. It's called strength and conditioning. And what it's supposed to do is to prepare your body for combat. So you can endure more during your, during your, sorry, during your technique workouts, you can <coughs> take more punishment, and therefore you're going to be able to train more effectively on your technique days. It also allows you to target specific problems. For example, um, I don't know if there are any, any runners here. Yeah. Usually if, if people run and they have a muscular imbalance in their legs, it's not going to go away with running. It's going to become worse. Because when running, you're going to use the muscles that are strongest and let the weak muscles become weaker. And you can counterbalance that with a strength and conditioning program. Um, you can 
improve your strength, your explosiveness, your endurance, your agility, your grip strength. Um, yeah, it helps prevent injuries if you do it right. It causes injuries if you do it wrong. Um, it can increase your toughness on the mental side. If you've ever done a set of 20 rep squats, you know that by rep number 10 you're going to see Jesus Christ walking on the water. But you're going to keep squatting. <laughs> it can help you improve <coughs> specific techniques. Which means uh, for some throws you're going to, le to need lifting strength. For some throws you're going to need squatting strength. For some throws you're going to need pulling strength. And if you do your strength right, then this is going to help you do throws that you haven't been able to do previously. Overall, it increases your chances of winning. Just a very quick look on how strength and conditioning <coughs> is supposed to work. Um, the whole concept is called progressive overload, meaning that if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you're not going to become better. You somehow have to uh, increase the stress on your body, so you have to adapt. How do you do that? Either, let's, let's take the push-up for example. You can do a push-up, you want to do more push-ups, you do more push-ups, right? For example, at the beginning, beginning you may be able to do three or four in a row. So maybe you do just three, but five times. So you have done 50 push-ups. And at the, at the end of a couple of weeks, you're going to be able to do at least seven. You can use more weight. In the push-up, you use a backpack for your slant. Um, you can use a larger range of motion. If you do push-ups, you know that the top part is the easiest one, and at the bottom it becomes more difficult. So, if you do, for example, 10 repetitions at the top, and work your way down, you're doing more work. Um, you could use a harder exercise variation. Let's take the push-up again. To make it harder, put one arm on your back, or you kick up into a handstand. It's going to be harder. Um, you could do your push-ups faster. For example, you can add in a clap or two or three. Uh, you could do it extra slow. Ten seconds on the way down, ten seconds on the way up, something like that. Or you could do, you could do um, if you do sets, like, like I said, sets of three, five times, you can decrease the rest between the sets. So at the end it will be five push-ups, uh, 10 seconds rest, five push-ups, something like that. Or you can pre-exhaust yourself, which would mean kick up into a handstand, hold it for three minutes, and then do push-ups. You're going to be tired already. And finally, you could do push-ups for time without looking at the number of push-ups you do and just increase the time. For example, you start with 20 seconds, you work, you work up to one minute. Um, what ranges of repetitions do you use for what? If you want to train strength, you're going to do uh, one to five repetitions. If you can do more, the weight's too light. If you want to do strength endurance or anaerobic endurance, you're probably going to choose a rep range between 15 and 40. And if you train for endurance, you're going to use more than 40 reps. Just as a basic guideline. It's not set in stone just to give you an idea. Okay, speaking of push-ups, let's talk about <coughs> calisthenics. On the left, we have a traditional engine push-up. It's called the cat push-up, the dance engine <coughs> push-up. And it mimics the motion of a sprawl. A sprawl is a double leg for friends. So, it's kind of useful for, rest, for wrestling. Um, also, handstand push-ups in the middle. You can use some form of equipment like uh, my all-time favorite exercise, rope climbing, or uh, the guy on the bottom of the left is using a malaka, which is basically the Indian version of pole dancing. <laughs> um, also, there's bridging, which is very important in wrestling, uh, Western wrestling. Uh, it's the exercise you see on the right. Uh, basically for developing a good suplex, the floor we've talked about, and 
for developing a good defense on the bottom because you don't want your shoulder blades pinned to the mat, you're going to bridge up. And the goal of bridging is to produce necks like that. <laughs> So, let's talk about training tools for wrestling. Any ideas? What, what is the best training tool for wrestling? Yeah, exactly. It's the guy on top. He doesn't seem to be enjoying it very much, but anyway. So, let, let's look at what is called body weight training. You basically use the other guy as a means of resistance. Either by his weight, which you can see on the left, pick him up in various ways, carry him around, squat down with him, or you can use his muscles. So you, you take his arms and pull towards and let him pull back. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, the pictures on the right, again, they're very dark, but you can have someone sit on your back while you're doing push ups. Let me tell you, it's not easy. Um, then you can do. Uh, yeah, it's called partner überschlag. Pick someone up and do uh, backhand springs with his legs. <coughs> if that makes any sense. Um, you can have him pull, you can have him push. It's basically everything is possible. And, yeah. Of course, if you're good at manhandling people around, it also makes for a good party trick. <laughs> I'm going to put the presentation online afterwards so you can look up the stuff. It's just like coming out here. <coughs> okay, weight training. Uh, the oldest method of weight training is probably lifting stones, as can be seen on the left. Stones are also very hard to lift pound for pound. Lifting a 200 pound stone is much, it's going to be much harder than a 200 pound barbell. Just the way it is. Um, yeah, we have the basic barbell exercises, which are the power clean, lifting the weight through your shoulders, the squat, putting it on your back, squatting down, uh, the deadlift, picking it up from the floor, and you have the snatch, which is basically picking it up and going up in, in one motion. Also, there are a number of exercises with lighter weights you can do. I've only put on, uh, I've only put the proven ones up here. Basically, it's uh, alternate curling, which is good for pummeling and hand fighting. Um, alternate presses, which is again good for pummeling. Uh, hack squats, which are squats with the weight behind your back, which are supposed to strengthen your knees. And then there's various exercises of taking a light weight and swinging it around. That's supposed to maintain <coughs> your core and mimic the effect that an opponent pulling on your arm has on you. Um, at the bottom you see the so-called Bulgarian backs. It's the most modern version of this uh, swing weights or whatever you call it. You can also make your own easily from a, an old inner tube of a car tire. While the, ori the original ones cost something around 250 euros a piece. <laughs> Okay, anyone who has seen Rocky knows what road work is. Um, it's either steady state running, just like marathon runners do all the time, or you can do intervals, which is usually preferred by wrestlers. For example, you sprint 200 meters, you jog or walk 100 meters, and you do it all over again. You could run upstairs, you could run up a hill, you could um, carry logs or people or whatever, farm animals, <coughs> which is a, a historically uh, proven method, method of training wrestlers. If anyone knows uh, Milo from Croton, he did just that. Yeah, here I put together a little comparison of, of what the various wrestling styles use in terms of exercise. So, on the left, you have body weight exercises, and basically everyone does that. We have calisthenics, body weight exercises, everyone does that too. We have rope climbing, which is done by everyone except the sumo wrestlers, <coughs> but they do a lot of pulling with, uh, with sleds and with each other, with the belts, so they have some form 
of that uh, kind of resistance too. We have weight training, it's basically everyone does some form of that too. We have rubber bands, <coughs> which are used uh, very widely in wrestling and judo, but not in Indian wrestling and in sumo. And we have running, which again is used by everyone except the sumo wrestlers. For some reason. <laughs> Um, in wrestling, they also use wrestling dummies for some purposes, especially throws that you don't want to do regularly with a live opponent because they are too damaging. For example, for example, I don't know too many guys who like being suplexed. It's not that pleasant, and if you do it too often, it tends to pop out your elbow that way. Which is why most of the Eastern European wrestlers have big scars here or here. Um, also, the East Germans were very creative and they built a number of machines specifically for wrestling moves. Sadly, they, you basically can't get them. They are somewhere still away. And as you can see, this principle works. At least it worked for Alexander Karelin. Uh, let's look at the <coughs> Indian wrestlers. They were very successful and very famous at the turn of the last century. Um, and they use some unique forms of weight, which are usually derived from weapons or from farm gear. You have the big mace, which is swung like this. It's called the gada. You have the clubs, which are called the yori. You usually do something like this. Again, an alternate curl with dumbbells. Um, they have big stones, big stone rings that they can hang around their heads to run and squat with. What they call the ring around the waist, I don't know. And yeah, at the bottom we have the, the Russian version of training with clubs. Um, in sumo they use a number of unique stuff too. For example, sumo wrestlers are usually very good at doing the splits because they're going to drive out of a very... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and for that purpose, they do some other exercises too. Very wide squats with stomping and hitting a wall or iron pole. Uh, in judo, <coughs> The most famous exercise is probably Uchikomi, which is throw entries. You do them over and over and over again. Uh, you can tie a rubber band to a tree or something, and you do entries to the Yunagi. And it works very well for judo because in judo with the clothing, you have repeatable situations. If you got the grip on the clothing, it's fast. It, it holds. While in wrestling, the guy is sweating, he's slippery, you're going to have to make do with what you have. Also, they like to swing weights, <coughs> as seen on the bottom. And a traditional exercise is running with Tetsu Geta, or iron sandals, weighing about 5 to 10 kilos a piece. And it's supposed to strengthen your foot muscles. Shuai uh, Chiawa is uh, basically the Chinese version of Judo. And they have some nice exercises too, like the wrist roller, which is a piece of wood with a string, and the weight down, and you roll it up. It's uh, now used very commonly all around the world. And at the bottom on the right, you can see a uh, barrel turning, which is he has a big barrel, which weighs about 200 kilos, puts it on the edge, and rolls it around for waist strength. When is a wrestler considered strong? Uh, to answer that question, I've put you some of the East German standards up there. I don't know if you can read them, so I'm just going to pick up one weight category. My, my category is 74 kilos. So we have a moderate bench press of 110 kilos. That's not much, most gym rats can do that. But we have a pull up with 70 kilos around your waist. I don't know many gym goers who can do that. <coughs> you have to be able to squat 190 kilos, down to parallel, 
You have to be able to roll with 110 kilos, and you should be able to power clean, pick up a weight, and pull it to your shoulders with 115 kilos. So, while the single numbers aren't too hard, <coughs> the overall picture tends to be yeah, a bit of a work. I've tried to pick out some standards and adapt them for human wrestling. So I've uh, substituted the weight exercises with body weight exercises. <coughs> it's not something, something that you will be able to do from now to tomorrow. You'll have to work on it and maybe you'll never get up to there. But you have something to shoot for. So the standards I've picked is 20 full squats with a partner of your weight on your shoulders down there, back up, uh, 20 pull-ups for men, 5 pull-ups for women, feel free to do more, dive bomber push-ups, which is the Hindu push-up and going back up, you can do that, um, 60 for men, 20 for women, handstand push-ups, 15 for men, 3 for women, rope climbing for men, an 8 meter rope, run time up and down without the feet, for the ladies with the feet. Bridge, fall back into the bridge and hold it for one minute. Standing broad jump, which is a good explosive te a test of explosiveness. Men should be able to jump about two and a half meters, women about two. And at last, an endurance test, the 3,000 meter run. Men should be able to run it in under 30 minutes and women in under 14, 13. How can you build a wrestling <coughs> session? Just to give you an example, you could do 15 minutes warm-up, including rolling and bridging gymnastics. Then, what I like to do is to repeat the techniques of the last session, because usually people either forget them, or in some very rare cases, they have some questions about them. You can answer that. Then, I like to introduce normally no more than three new techniques, and have them work on it, at least 40 repetitions each, and then have people do some live drilling in pairs with 50% resistance, which means I let you get through with your techniques and you let me get through with most of mine. Finally, the advanced students <coughs> which have, who have been wrestling for at least <coughs> half a year can have one wrestling match for about five minutes. And if you still have time, you can do some more conditioning like body weights or circuit. So, home gyms, if you have the money, feel free to spend away. But I put some very inexpensive items up there that can help you a lot. First, on the top, it's a form of lightweight, the Bulgarian bag made of an inner tube. I have about 25 kilos of sand in there and it cost me about 5 euros. You can get the tires free at the tire shop. Then a jump rope, this one is homemade, it costs about 3 <coughs> euros. And at the bottom on the right, I have a rubber band, which I've taken out, it's, it's an old inner tube of a bike. You can get them for free too. And you can use them for some pulling exercises of Uchikomi. And of course, if you have a pull-up bar, that's great, <coughs> but you don't really need one. You can go out, do your pull-ups on a tree branch, or maybe on the stairs, or from the ledge of the door, something like that. You don't need a pull-up bar. You can do them anywhere. Uh, how can you structure your week? So, I've made a sample where people, where someone wants to train three times, which would mean he trains uh, Hema wrestling on Sunday and includes some bodyweight training there. He does judo or calisthenics on Tuesday. And uh, again, Hema on Thursday and does a circuit afterwards. So it's not that much, but you're working three times a week on your wrestling and I can guarantee it's going to improve. However, 
If you only wrestle at the HEMA club once per week for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, then it's going to take a long, long time for your wrestling to become any good. Also, of course, feel free to add in more stuff like more judo, some strength training, uh, some work, road work, or other cross training activities. For example, Charl Hofer recommended dancing. It's good, it's good for football, it's good for <coughs> your wine. It's, it's a good training if you like it. Then there's gymnastics or some of the ball games, which can be fairly rough too. For example, handball. Ever seen a handball space? It's great. <coughs> um, I put your sample circuit up there. I think it's better if you uh, check out the presentation online afterwards. Or oh, can you see it? Okay, so um, I'll break it down for you really quick. You do an exercise for 20 seconds as a beginner and you progress to one minute as an advanced uh, athlete and you have no breaks except between rounds and you're going to do two to six rounds of the whole thing. First you have pull-ups. Um, in 20 seconds you could do about 30 pull-ups which is decent. In one minute you could do easily 50 to 60 if you're able to do that. Then um, there's an exercise that requires a light weight, preferably a kettlebell or a stone with a sling on it. You hook it around your foot and you lift. Um, I've taken this circuit from an Eastern German manual of wrestling for little kids. And the Eastern German guys, they were really fond of the great white suplex, which is the thing I talked about earlier. You hook the guy, you throw him up, and that's an exercise for that. So it creates the lifting strength of your hips. Then you have jackknives, which is a sit-up with straight legs, where legs and hands meet at the top. Then uh, you have the form of the duck walk. You place two low boxes or something on the, on the floor, three meters apart and you're going to squat down there and you're going to move your resting stance over to the next one and squat down there and go back. Um, this is a really good exercise because most people at the beginning they tend to lose matches because their stance breaks down. So they're down there for maybe a minute or two and then the hips get higher and higher and the head get more and more forward and then it's very easy to get into the ground. Then you're going to do fast push-ups. Uh, I've tried to count, you can do about 50 to 60 push-ups in 20 seconds if you're fast. And that, that, that's far from the world record, so just feel free to try. Then again you have an action exercise, which is to hang from a pull-up bar and you swing your legs straight up. And then you have one leg squats with a hand on the wall. Of course you can just use this as a basis and substitute other exercises, for example, you could do two leg uh, squats or you could do rows <laughs> instead of pull-ups. It's just to show you an example of how you can build a workout. Uh, worker. Yeah, uh, there's also a concept called synergistic training. I don't want to go into much depth there, it just says that you should vary your exercises for the same muscle groups. You can do them all in a row, or you can do, for example, normal push-ups for eight weeks, and then switch to Hindu push-ups, and uh, then to very wide push-ups or very narrow ones. Just to keep your muscles challenged from many angles. Um, then there's the decks of cards routines. I like those a lot. Uh, it happens that when you do a lot of repetitions, the counting can get very boring. Or, yeah, you could use a stopwatch, but that's a bit complicated and everything. So you use cards to count the repetitions. The face value of the card tells you how, much repetitions to do, how many repetitions to do. You do them after prescribed exercise, flip over the next card and do those. Uh, the most famous one is the Gotch Bible which has you do two different kinds of push-ups and two different kinds of squats. Uh, in total it's 420 squats and 200 <coughs> push-ups. It's a really nice quick workout. I think I've done it in 14 minutes one time. 
uh, if, you, if you start out, it's going to take a bit longer than that. Or if you start out pretty close to the or something like that. Then uh, there's another variation, which is uh, the Conora. And in that, you do three exercises of the prescribed number for each and every card. Uh, which leads to about 450 push-ups, 900 sit-ups, and 225 pull-ups. I don't like that too much, or I only do it when I have to kill a lot of time. It takes about yeah, three quarters of an hour to an hour if you're quick. <coughs> then, a circuit you could do with a barber, if you have a barber. You have seven basic exercises, bench rows, high pulls, then overhead presses, good mornings, which is this. Then you have lunges, uh, a squat to push press, and you have a stiff leg deadlift. And you're going to do all of them in a row, eight repetitions <coughs> each for one round. And you're going to do up to six rounds of these. The weights used are fairly light, so if you weigh 200 pounds and are reasonably fit, then you're not going to use more than 62 to 65 kilos. But I promised you, it's an effort. Then we have plate circuits, which are really popular with wrestlers. This one comes from one of my wrestling coaches, Igor Mishkin, born of Russia. And uh, you pick a weight plate, which you can find basically anywhere. You can find one for a couple of years. Uh, usually, the adult wrestlers use about 20 to 25 kilos. And you do the exercises, 10 repetitions each, all in a row. You circle the plate around your head, left and right, 10 each. Then you do tricep presses behind your head. You do good mornings again. You do squats. You do bent rows. You do diagonal curves left and right. You're going to muscle out the plate in front and finally hold it there for 10 seconds. This is a very good training for your core. Again, for people pulling on your arms, pulling on your legs, whatever. After the circuit, you're supposed to do 60 push ups, 20 pull ups in a row, then go shower at home. Yeah, if you train a lot, you have to recover. Um, there's a lot of great books on that. I'm only going to scratch the surface. The basics are eat, sleep, and breathe. So you get food, you get sleep, you get oxygen, all there. Uh, I recommend to take at least one day off of training in a week. <coughs> uh, the competitive wrestlers don't always do that. I sometimes go for like three months or four months without a break. I don't recommend it, but sometimes that's the way it goes. Um, also, to prevent staleness, you should rotate your training phases. For example, it's a bad idea to train anaerobic endurance year-round because you're going to burn out. Anaerobic endurance is the stuff that builds up lots and lots of lactic acid in your muscles, and it uh, leads to staleness within usually a month to three months. Uh, you should keep the training enjoyable, because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it, unless you have a will of iron. And <coughs> if you do end up with sore muscles, a couple of uh, things that help are hot baths and saunas, sunshine, and taking some extra magnesium, or soda and, and or soda bicarbonate, which is baking powder. For some reason, it had to break down the saunas. When you're injured, as a wrestler, you're probably going to have to train around the injury. Because if you take a complete break, <coughs> then I can tell you at a competitive level, you're going to train about one month every year. So, when it comes to diet, use common sense. Eat when you're hungry, drink when you're thirsty. Everything else comes after that. Um, however, I don't recommend you eat or drink right before training, at least mad training, because if you do, you might end up seeing your lunch very soon, <laughs> than you expect. And finally, when you're injured, I recommend eating more protein, because usually when you have a torn muscle or something, you need material to repair that.
So, at the left side, we have some staples <coughs> traditional wrestling diets. At the top, we have ghee, which is uh, loved by the Indian wrestlers. It's basically butter fat, and they eat it by the pound. <laughs> yeah, really, the, the great wrestlers, they drink it. They heat it up and drink it. And the consumption of an elite wrestler used to be at least one pound per day. To build up size. I told you size is a great equalizer in wrestling. <laughs> Ask Harry. Uh, then below we have Chakonabe, which is uh, a meat soup with vegetables. It's uh, the preferred dish of sumo wrestlers. It's actually really healthy and it's considered to be part of the reason that sumo wrestlers don't get heart attacks all the time. And below you have something that looks rather strange. Um, it's a recommendation of Talhofer, which he laid out in the Königsegger Codex. And he says for breakfast you should have a carob. It's called uh, Johannesbrot in German. Yeah. And uh, for dinner you should have a slice of dry bread laid into cold water. If you do that, the water is going to, to look slightly yellow to orange, but it doesn't taste all that bad. <laughs> okay, so. A couple of my own eating recommendations. I'm not going to tell you to eat less because you're not going to listen to me anyway. I'm telling you to eat more, but more to more of what? I think you should eat more fruits, more vegetables, and you should try to get a healthy share of good proteins. So how can you do that? You could do, eat something like oats and fruits with yogurt for breakfast. You could eat a nice steak, vegetables for dinner, and during the day you could eat one or two eggs, a couple of fruits, a couple of nuts, something like that. And if you want to change your weight, which most people do these days, then I can only recommend the use of a good bathroom scale and of a measuring tape and of logging down your weight and your measurements. It tends to keep you focused. There are injuries. Injuries will happen, especially at the competitive level, you have to deal with that. Uh, just to give you the most common ones, usually it's in wrestling it's joints, like knees, elbows, shoulders, fingers. Um, I don't think I have a finger that hasn't been sprained yet. It's okay, it's the way things go and it doesn't hinder you very much, you just tape it to the finger next to it and keep going. And however, the case of the, the right is a bit extreme, it says the, the pinky finger sticking off like that. And uh, then there's cauliflower ears, which are basically hematoma in your ears. The blood runs in there, and it can't go back out, it stays there, and the ears become all big and clumpy. So, to sum things up, and I'm glad I am done, if you want to wrestle better, you should wrestle, first and foremost. You should cross train in other styles. Personally, I think judo is probably going to be the best choice for most people, due to the reasons explained at the start. But you should keep in mind that the rules of the wrestling, child, uh, wrestling style you choose will dictate what you do. So if you train for him, if you want to wrestle competitively, like Fury does, then you have to include some powers in there. Next, fitness doesn't have to be, ex uh, to be expensive. I think I've made that fairly clear. Then, train hard, but train smart, and focus on your training. So, for example, if you're doing <laughs> which are the pro entries, you, do you shouldn't imagine you're pulling a rubber band. You should imagine, there's the sleeve, there's his collar, and there the guy goes over. Um, you should <coughs> maximize your strengths. Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> and minimize your weaknesses. You have, should have standards to judge yourself against, so you can see where you're at. You shouldn't try to do everything at once. You should um, make some goals and go after them, and after a while maybe change the goals. <coughs> And every two to three months, you should re-evaluate re your training. What have you done? What, what did you want to do? Where are you going? If you want to change your training, you should introduce the change slow, slowly, and your body will thank you for it. And finally, 
I think these are the most important two sentences in this whole presentation. If you lose, get up, <coughs> think why you lost, and train hard. <coughs> and if you win, get up, think why you won, think what you maybe didn't do so well, and then train harder. Thank you. Thank you.